So every two years in the uh, pastel deserts of Tucson, Arizona, um, there's a gathering of about 600 or so people who are really interested in understanding um, one of the hardest and most interesting problems, which is uh, what is the basis of consciousness. And uh, one kind of very unique thing about this conference is that it brings together people from many different traditions. So scientists, philosophers, spiritual seekers, um, uh, therapists. And so uh, it's kind of a very interesting venue because people who have very vastly different um, kind of uh, structures from which they're coming to study this problem come together and try to figure out a solution. And uh, Stuart has kind of very key role in um, developing this conference and it really reflects his own kind of approach to studying consciousness as well. Um, so he started um, becoming really interested in consciousness um, in uh, the 60s and um, soon thereafter went into medical school where he studied cancer. And uh, one kind of very interesting thing about um, his studies with cancer cells is that he realized that um, the seemingly trivial operation of a cell separating into two cells actually requires a great finesse. Somehow the genes that are tugged apart and separated into two cells um, <coughs> land there with a great precision, which um, while we take for granted is something that goes horribly awry in things like cancer. And it seems like microtubules play a very key role in achieving this very precise separation. And around, around that time, Stuart found out that um, these microtubules also play a very key role in structuring um, the very complex dendritic and axonal structure of neurons. And um, looking at the, the way that these uh, microtubule subunits uh, tessellate with each other struck Stuart because it reminded him of uh, 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 computer matrices, and that actually started a uh, many decade long obsession for Stuart uh, in this realm, and, um, and slowly he started piecing together uh, his ideas of this very beautiful structure that is pervasive throughout neurons, and uh, tried to come up with ideas that, of what it might be able to achieve for neurons, and um, at that time started reading some of the stuff by Penrose, and uh, Stuart and Roger were great uh, complements to each other because whereas uh, uh, Roger had this um, beautiful kind of mechanism uh, for computation that didn't have a structure, Stuart had the structure in mind that didn't have a mechanism and so it started a very fruitful collaboration. And, um, and so here you'll hear some of the ideas that Stuart's been uh, developing for decades and um, Interestingly enough, uh, in many uh, neuroscience departments, all of this stuff is very foreign. So for example, very few of us have actually picked up any of the ideas that Stuart will be presenting today because we're very firmly kind of wedged in this idea that spikes somehow mediate some uh, and are sufficient for uh, explaining all of this very profound experience that we're all having. Uh, so we really look forward to hearing what Stuart has to say. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Gotham. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Great, great turnout. So I'm a bit of a heretic being kind of outside uh, the main field of neuroscience, but I, I followed it very closely. And uh, my topic, quantum cognition and brain microtubules. And what you see here is a neuron. Uh, there's the nucleus. And the yellow are the microtubules, and red are actin. And basically, the key point is that most everybody uh, looks at what's happening at the membrane and ignores what's going on inside. So in medicine, in my field, that'd be like being a dermatologist and forgetting about everything else. So um, <clears throat> let me begin by, by picking, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, taking issue with some conventional wisdom in cognitive neuroscience. These are the kind of basic tenets of, neuro, of cognitive neuroscience that I've observed that I think uh, we have to challenge. So the first is that consciousness emerges from complex synaptic interactions among many simple neurons. The second is that relevant neuronal information is completely membrane-based, based on the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron that synaptic strengths mediate memory and learning, synaptic plasticity, uh, uh, heavy and learning, LTP, and that classical Bayesian probability mathematics governs cognition. And this, is, uh, uh, this challenge is a fairly new one. So um, the bottom line and solution to all these issues is to consider a finer scale of information processing in the neuronal cytoskeleton. So uh, I'm giving away the punchline here is that I think we need to go down to this level to find the roots of co cognition and, and consciousness. <clears throat>
So let's, uh, let's look at the first one. Cognition emerges from complex synaptic interaction among many simple neurons. So here's a biological neuron. Here's what computer scientists uh, view as a neuron. And here's kind of a toy neuron. And basically, integrate and fire. So the dendrite uh, and cell body integrate inputs, usually thought of only at the membrane, but I'll challenge that because I think it's happening inside also, to a threshold at the axon uh, initiation segment to fire uh, an output or spike. And generally, the, the dogma is that the spikes are the currency of, of the brain, of cognition and consciousness, although local field potentials, EEG, dendritic synchrony, come from the other side. I would say that really consciousness and, and the important aspects of cognition are happening in the dendrite, and the firing is just conveying the information from that to the next synapse, the next layer. So if we make a, a network of... Oops. If we make a network of these toy neurons at the bottom, like this, and put inputs uh, at the left and have outputs, and this is like a, a poor man's cheap simulation of a neural network, you can see that we get uh, simple neurons either firing or not firing, and we get different outputs, and depending, with synaptic plasticity adjustment, uh, we can get learning. The basic idea is that cognition stems from complex computation among simple neurons, spiking. However, when you think about it, single-cell organisms perform compl fairly complex cognitive functions. So here's a paramecium. Uh, one cell doesn't have any synapses. It, it bounces into an object and goes a different way. It avoids predators. Uh, it avoids obstacles, as you can see. It finds food. It finds a mate. It has sex with a partner. Over here is an X-rated picture of two <laughs> paramecium uh, coupling. And uh, interestingly, they're only, the only time they're absolutely still is during sec. Is during sex. So there they are. And how do they do that? Well, they move around and they sense by these hair-like projections called cilia, which connect to uh, internal cytoskeleton. The cilia are made of, of microtubules, nine couplets of microtubules shown here that are found in, um, in all, uh, virtually all animal cells. We have them in our lungs. We have them in our GI tract. We have them all over the place. And they bend back and forth, and they also sense. So uh, <clears throat> and then they go into an internal cytoskeleton, uh, the same microtubules inside the cell. And uh, Gotham mentioned, I don't know if you can see this, Gotham mentioned mitosis. So here's a cell dividing, and the yellow are the centrioles, which are basically like cilia. The blue are the, cro thank you. The blue are the chromosomes, and the red would be the microtubules pulling them apart. And what he was saying is that if this doesn't work perfectly, if you have uh, uh, an ab uh, asymmetric mitosis, you get an abnormal genotype. And this was an old theory of, of cancer uh, that uh, goes back 100 years to Bovary and was picked up by... Duisburg, who I think is here, uh, that aneuploidy or abnormal mitosis causes cancer. Then uh, the geneticists came in and oncogenes and repressor genes. And to my mind, that really hasn't solved the problem. And people are going back to the idea that maybe mitosis per se might be the problem. But that's kind of a, a digression. Except that the cilia and centrioles are these structures here. And uh, they're made up of, in this case, triplets. It can be doublets or triplets of microtubules in this mega cylinder of nine uh, <clears throat> pairs or triplets of microtubules that form centrioles and their same structure of cilia. And in simple organisms, they, they, uh, they sense photons. Uh, euglena, the centrioles in euglena, <clears throat> Albert Bueller showed that will, will detect light and point the, uh, the cell in another direction. And the same structure is found in all our rod and cone cells. So every photon that gets into our eye has to go through the narrow stalk to get to the rhodopsin in the back. And through this, uh, this structure, which are, uh, and all primitive uh, visual systems are, are ciliated ectoderm, have this sort, sort of structure. And it's interesting that the structure is pretty much the same diameter as the wavelength of photons, suggesting that it, they might be some kind of um, optical devices or quantum optical devices capturing a, <coughs> um, orbital or angular momentum or something. That's another digression, though. So let's get back to neurons. So in neurons, uh, as we said, there are many microtubules inside neurons. This is a cartoon uh, version of a, of a neuron. And uh, a couple of things to notice. So here's the dendrite and the, and the soma here. The microtubules are interrupted. They're not continuous. And they're in opposite direction. They have a polarity. And <clears throat> they're, they're of mixed polarity here, interconnected by these microtubule-associated proteins. In axons, they're continuous and unipolar. So I think all the interesting processing is going on here, and you can see the blow-up of the microtubules there that form these networks that are uh, an anti-parallel networks, and also gap junctions in which, uh, through which I think there can be information exchange from microtubule to microtubule, possibly by quantum entanglement 
or some other mechanism. So we get kind of a layer of integration here that can do collective integration, which would be mo uh, much more um, uh, efficient than individual uh, integrating fire. So we have kind of a collective integration possibility here going on in the, in the dendrites and the cell bodies. Okay, moving on to the next uh, uh, conventional wis wisdom is that relevant neuronal information is completely membrane-based, the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron. So here you have the cell body and dendrites, as I said. Uh, inputs come in, uh, membrane potentials integrate to a threshold here, and then firing or not firing in a digital binary mechanism onto the next layer, and that's kind of the, the party line. However, the firing threshold and brain neuron vary on a spike-to-spike -spike basis due to non-membrane factors, as shown in this, in this paper by Nandorf et al. and others uh, in 2007. So here's what the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron would predict, that you integrate to a threshold, a very narrow threshold, and you fire within a very narrow uh, temporal range. However, actual neurons in, in animal brains that are awake, uh, brains of awake animals, have a very wide threshold and, a very, and temporal variability. So there's, uh, despite, what, despite the fact that the membrane potential is going to be the same from spike to spike, there's a, a, um, a, a difference. So there's some other factor uh, going on that influences spiking that can control behavior, because you control spiking controls behavior downstream, and that's how we move our stuff and speak and everything. So uh, dendritic integration has some X factor, some mysterious, I don't know if it's mysterious, but some other factor that I think could be coming from internally in the microtubules and uh, in, in this neuron, but also from other neurons through the, through the gap junctions. So dendritic in integration that can affect and alter uh, spiking and control influence behavior. And I think consciousness may be, may be happening here, and when consciousness kicks in, that's what uh, changes the, the spiking threshold. So you can have conscious control of your actions. The next uh, objection is to synaptic strengths, mediate memory, uh, Donald Hebb, LTP, the idea that the proteins uh, usually thought of as postsynaptic change their sensitivity, and uh, as the sensitivity goes up, threshold goes, goes down, and uh, this synapse becomes uh, more likely to be activated, and that's how learning occurs. However, these proteins are, are transient. They last hours to days, and memories can last lifetimes. So where is memory stored? That's a good question. Now, you could say, well, that's in the membrane proteins, it just gets replenished. So how does it get replenished? So here's a neuron, and this is actually a dendrite. This is the axon here. And uh, membrane receptors and enzymes and, and proteins and stuff that need to get transported from the cell body where they're synthesized down to a synapse here or anywhere are transported along microtubules by a process called axoplasmic transport or dendroplasmic, if it's in the dendrite, by motor proteins kinesin and dynein, which move along a track and carry the uh, membrane proteins to the right place. So remember, these microtubules are interrupted, so they have to kind of jump, jump tracks and, and change, uh, change tracks many times, and then you come to a branching point, and they have to decide where to go, so which synapse needs it there or there. Well, how do they know where to go, <clears throat> especially since the microtubules are, are disrupted? Well, it turns out that tau, the famous tau protein from Alzheimer's disease, guides the uh, motor proteins and tells them where and when to get off. It's like a uh, traffic light. And I, I'm sorry I don't have the reference from this paper. It was about two years ago. And it tells the, uh, the motor proteins where to get off. So it's the tau protein that's the traffic signal guiding uh, synaptic plasticity. So you could say, well, the intelligence is in the tau. Well, maybe, but the, the real intelligence is where the tau is, is bound at a, on the microtubule, on the microtubule lattice. So the information seems to be embedded in the microtubule lattice binding the tau, and then that, that guides the motor proteins. So it's not all membrane uh, synaptic plasticity. And as you know, in Alzheimer's disease, the tau falls off, and uh, microtubules depolymerize, and you get Alzheimer's disease. You lose memory, cognition, and eventually consciousness. And uh, now everybody talks about the amyloid plaques uh, where the genes point to, but the amyloid plaques per se don't cause cognitive dysfunction. Uh, we had a recent paper with uh, Rudy Tanzi, who is the Alzheimer's ex ex expert at, uh, at Harvard, and uh, he's, uh, he actually discovered most of the genes for, for the amyloid plaques, but he, uh, he believes that it's the, uh, a problem in the neuron, in the neurofibrillary tangles. So here's a microtubule, and the tau falls off, and the microtubules destabilizes. 
uh, and falls apart. Now, it could be that the microtubule destabilizes and then the tau falls off. And one of the, one of the possibilities is that uh, we found that zinc, uh, Rudy found that, that uh, beta amyloid sequester zinc lowers the zinc levels, and when you lower zinc levels inside the neurons, you destabilize the microtubules. You don't have the strong force. You have a weaker force binding them together. So low zinc by uh, beta amyloid sequestration may be mediate uh, Alzheimer's disease, the bottom line being that your microtubules destabilize. If your microtubules fall apart, you lose cognition. Oops. So <clears throat> where is memory stored? One, uh, one thing we know about it is from LTP, long-term potentiation, is that when uh, calcium comes in through uh, uh, synaptic activation, uh, calcium activates calcium calmodulin uh, to form a holoenzyme called calcium calmodulin ki uh, kinase 2, CAMK2. CAMK2 then binds to microtubules and distributes around that whole neuron and neighboring neurons through the dendritic arbors quite rapidly. And uh, CAMK2 can phosphorylate uh, targets. The question is, what is, it, what is it phosphorylating? Because that would be a, uh, a source, uh, a site for memory storage. So CAMK2 is a very interesting uh, molecule. Here it is before it gets activated. It's hexagonal, snowflake-shaped. Here we're looking at the top of it, and here we're looking at, at a side view. Then calcium comes in, and calcium causes it to extend these legs, or arms, I call them legs. Uh, kinase domains are called from this association domain, six above and six below. And each of these legs can phosphorylate a target. And, uh, or not. So you can think of it as a bit. So each of these legs is a bit. Uh, and the phosphorylation sites are here. They're actually on the, on the f upper part of the foot, if you want to call these feet. And somehow that phosphorylates something which would be a good candidate to store memory. Well, what do you think it phosphorylates? So here's all these microtubules. Uh, you can't avoid them. We know that CAMK2 binds to microtubules. So the question is, how does CAMK2, activated CAMK2, uh, relate or bind to microtubules? And the answer is perfectly. There's a perfect match. Uh, and this we published in this paper um, where if you take the CAMK2 and you overlay it on the microtubule lattice, there's two types of lattices. That's the A lattice and that's the B lattice. Either way, because of the play in the legs, they match up perfectly. And they can, the six uh, kinase domains can match six uh, tubulin dimers in a hexagonal lattice. And each of the six can phosphorylate or not phosphorylate. So you have six bits of information conveyed from the synapse to the microtubules via CAMK2. And order to raise of bits are called bytes. So basically you have a byte of information uh, potentially conveyed from the synapse to the uh, microtubule by CAMK2. So this is what the, the force field looks like. That it shows that they will bind. And uh, um, here we show the... Cam could do having landed on the microtubule. And here we show how the phosphorylation occurs. There's two mechanisms. One is through the C-termini, and the other is by unfolding of the, uh, of the uh, kinase domain. So that, and we, down to the amino acid level, so that each of the six kinase domains can phosphorylate one tubule in a microtubule lattice. And this gives rise to potential for uh, an enormous amount of information. So here we have uh, three possible uh, w uh, ways to look at this. One is... Um, uh, the, t the top two are in the A lattice, and the bottom is the B lattice. The top one, we just go by dimers, and the bottom two, we go by monomers. So you can phosphorylate uh, this one or this one in a monomer, for example. And depending on how you, uh, how you play the game, you either get a, the possibility for, for a six-tubulin uh, neighborhood of 64 possible bits in the top row, something like 500 in the middle row, to 5,000 in this row. So from one CAMK2, uh, depending on, on which, which of its kinase domains phosphorylate the tubulin. So the potential for information processing from encoding from synaptic input into the microtubule is vast. Now you could say, well, this phosphorylation doesn't last, and then it could be hardwired uh, in, in a number of ways by post-translational modifications, uh, the C-termini, these little hairs that stick out metal ions, other ligands that could be induced by the phosphorylation, binding of microtubule uh, proteins or transfer to neurofilaments. So these are ways that the uh, temporary phosphorylation can be encoded and hardwired. So here we have, just to kind of summarize, a CAMK2 landing on the microtubule, leaving this hexagonal pattern and then going on its way.
and this could be imparting information, synaptic information. It doesn't have to be all six. It could be any, any uh, permutation of it. Well, how would it be read out? So you have information in the microtubule. So what? What's it going to do? Well, one way, as I showed earlier, is that uh, integration in dendrites can modulate axonal fire firing. There's a, a couple seats up here if you guys want to come up. <clears throat> Modulating uh, <clears throat> uh, firing, controlling behavior. So it's possible that this integration and information processing in the dendritic microtubules could, could be controlling uh, uh, axonal firing that way. Forming uh, microtubule map scaffolding, neuronal growth, reshaping synapses, synaptic plasticity, motor protein routing, routing as I showed you before with the tau, storing memory, and consciousness, which we'll come to in a second. So read out, there's plenty of ways that the microtubule information could be read out to influence the higher, higher level stuff. Well, this relates to information processing <coughs> in microtubules. And as Gotham uh, mentioned, I've been interested in this for many years, uh, since uh, my days in medical school, uh, looking at microtubules and learning about computer matrices at the same time. And I first published in 1982 in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, and then through the 80s uh, about classical information processing. So here's the structure of a microtubule. Each tubulin, each peanut-shaped protein, we say here can be in one of two states, black or white. And what those states are is a critical question. We'll, com we'll come back to that. And uh, <clears throat> so there's about 10 to the ninth tubulins in a neuron, a billion. Uh, each, and they, they oscillate in the, in the megahertz, 10 to the seventh. So you get potentially 10 to the ninth times 10 to the uh, seventh, 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron. This is very uh, uh, disconcerting to my AI colleagues because they claim that the entire brain is 10 to the 16th uh, operations per second, something like that, 10 to the 11th neurons, 10,000 synapses, 1,000 per second. They get 10 to the 16th of the whole brain. So they say, well, when we have a computer in silicon that has 10 to the 16th operations per second, we'll have the equivalent of the brain, the singularity, everybody would be wonderful. Uh, give me your money to sign up. Yes, sir. I heard oscillations at 10 to the 7th hertz, which I guess I'll explain later, and the readouts and encoding when Calmodulin sticks onto it. Does that sticking on and off happen at 10 to the 7th? No. Also, or those I think those are different time scales. Yeah, but once the memory is, is in there, it can participate in the, in the ongoing uh, oscillations and upgrading of a cellular automata, which is basically what I, the, the early uh, idea was that um, it's like a cellular automata or molecular automata where each tubulin by dipole interaction, that, that's what this, this model is based on. We've gone to a slightly better model recently, but... Um, <clears throat> cellular automata, where the dipole of each interacts with its neighbor at discrete time steps, the megahertz being the discrete time steps, and it updates uh, roughly in the millisecond, or uh, megahertz range. So 10 to the 16th operations per second, in potentially per neuron, which is vast, and, and as I said, way more than what the singularity types are, are projecting. So they're not very happy with me about this. Anyway, uh, so I was going around to neural net meetings and AI meetings in the 80s being very annoying to people saying, no, no, you've got to push the goalpost way, way down. And uh, there's all this information going on. And then one day somebody said, uh, well, let's say you're right, wise guy. Uh, how would that explain consciousness? How would that explain joy, love, pinkness, redness, whatever? And I didn't know. I, I, I was, you know, this is the hard problem. Dave Chalmers subsequently made famous the, the hard problem, the nature of experience, while we have phenomenal experience. But the same person very fortunately suggested I read a book by Roger Penrose called uh, The Emperor's New Mind, which was many things, including a slap in the face to AI, but he argued for a quantum physics mechanism in consciousness, a type of collapse, that this particular collapse mediated by uh, processes in fundamental space-time geometry that I won't go into caused this collapse in a moment of consciousness, and there was some kind of quantum computing going on in the brain. Quantum computing meaning that you have a, not, not just bits of one or zero, but quantum superposition bits of one and zero that interact with many other quantum bits or qubits and then collapse to, to bits, and that, that's the answer. So I didn't really understand all that. Uh, I, I read the book, and I read Henry's work, and uh, uh, tried to get into this quantum business, which was pretty foreign to me at the time. But it occurred to me that uh, Roger uh, had, had a mechanism, but he didn't have a structure. He didn't have a good structure any, uh, for a quantum computer in the brain. Uh, and I had a structure, but I didn't have a mechanism. So I wrote to him, and uh, to make a long story short, we teamed up. He liked the idea of microtubules. He liked the uh, Fibonacci geometry inherent in the A lattice and many other things about it. And it was much smaller and closer to the quantum level and could be quantum, a quantum computer. So we teamed up and uh, published, uh, developed our model called Orchestrated Objective Reduction. 
I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And, uh, and we were attacked even before our first article came out uh, for various reasons. Patricia Churchland and uh, many others tried to kind of pull the rug out before we actually even, even published. But, um, and we've had many critics over the years and skeptics. And, uh, but uh, I'm happy to say we're still, we're still kicking. And uh, I think uh, our argument is as strong, if not stronger, than ever. But anyway, after hooking up with Roger, we, we published a number of papers on quantum computing in microtubules, and we're working on another one now for a journal called Physics of Life Reviews that uh, will invite commentaries, and I hope to invite our severest critics and plus a few friends and see what they say. So we'll come back to the quantum business. <clears throat> the last point uh, is that classical Bayesian probability mathematics governs cognition. And uh, Bayesian is uh, probabilities, interactive probabilities. Uh, you, probably, you probably know more about it than I do, or some of you at least do. Bayesian networks express joint probability distributions over many inter interrelated hypotheses. And this is an idea of how we think, that we have these, these probabilities and hypotheses, and you kind of move in a random walk from one to another and, and then come to a conclusion. This is kind of uh, the standard, I, I think, in, in cognitive neuroscience. Now, quantum cognition says the mathematics of quantum, uh, uh, quantum mathematics is more applicable to what the brain does than classical Bayesian. And uh, it applies the formalism of quantum theory to model cognitive phenomena, memory concepts, conceptual reason, judgment, perception, decision making. And here are a number of, of, uh, of papers. Busmeier and Bruza. Uh, actually, Dirk Ertz has been saying this for years. Krennikov, a number of people going, going way back. But uh, uh, Busmeier and Pothos and Bruza in the last few years have really uh, come on strong with this. And uh, they have, for example, they have a um, BBS Target article in press. And, uh, and I have a response, uh, uh, a commentary in the same issue. I think it's probably the next issue. I'm not sure. So quantum cognition, what's it good for? Well, um, for example, and this is from uh, uh, Boosmeyer and Pados's, uh, Boosmeyer and Wang's actually, a lead article in yet another uh, special issue of a journal called Topics in Cognitive Science that'll be all about this, that uh, they point out the psychological conflict, ambiguity, and uncertainty can be viewed as quantum superposition of multiple possible judgments and beliefs. In other words, instead of going this way or that way on, a, on some kind of decision tree, you're in superposition both states. They somehow interact by quantum entanglement and then can collapse to an answer. The second point would be measurement, answer, answering a question. You know, I'm not really sure you asked me a question. Okay, I have to decide. Or I just kind of decide on my own. Reaching a decision reduces possibilities to definite states, constructing reality, collapsing the wave function. And there's different ways to look at this, and I'd like to hear Henry's opinion about it later. But the point is that uh, measurement, uh, of however you define it, reduces all these quantum superpositions to definite states is your answer. That's a quantum computation. Another uh, point about uh, quantum mathematics is that previous questions influence subsequent answers. So you can ask a question, uh, the famous one in the book, and is, uh, is Gore honest and is Clinton honest? And back when, uh, right after they, they were in office, uh, if you ask, the, depending on the sequence you ask them, you get different answers. And that, that holds for a lot of types of questions. This is uh, non-commutativity. So in, in, in uh, Classical physics, A times B equals B times A. In quantum physics, A times B does not equal B times A. So there's some context, there's, you know, what happened previously influences uh, subsequent. And finally, judgments and choices may deviate from classical logic, suggesting uh, quantum influence, either random or, according to Roger Penrose, non-computable influences embedded in the fine scale structure of the universe that can influence these in a way that's not random, but might inf uh, Tell some platonic values or something like that. Okay, so quantum cognition is this mathematical approach, and from Wikipedia they 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 say, well, the field the field clearly distinguishes its, itself from the quantum mind as it is not reliant on the hypothesis that there is something quantum mechanical about the brain. So they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're trying to say we're using quantum mathematics, but we don't want to go on that risky limb that there's quantum biology in the brain because everybody knows the brain's too warm, wet, and noisy to have quantum computing going on. Uh, nonetheless, some of us do feel that the brain has quantum biology, and it has to. And for example, if a classical system would try to simulate a, a quantum system, you'd have exponential slowdown, as, as Feynman showed. It, it, it would be, you wouldn't be able to do it. It would involve so much computation. And what would be the point of using a classical system in the brain to, 
to simulate a quantum system if you could have the quantum system. So um, that would be me, uh, something quantum mechanical about the brain. And so Roger and I came out with our theory in the mid-1990s, and here's the basic idea that inside a, a dendrite, and these microtubules should be interrupted, each of the tubulins can not, not only be in bit states of one or zero, zero, as we saw in the black and white, but also quantum superposition of both states is a qubit. And the qubits talk to, uh, it, uh, entangle with other qubits in the same neuron and different neurons through uh, gap junctions, reach a threshold that he defined as E equals H over T, that I'll come to in a minute. When that happens, you have a moment of consciousness. We calculated this, for example, for 40 hertz, how many tubulins and superpositions for it to happen every 25 milliseconds, and got reasonable numbers like 20 to 100,000 neurons, for example. There's a couple problems with this model, however. Uh, well, first of all, here we are in 1994, after the first Tucson conference. We're all younger then. There's Roger, there's me, there's Dave Chalmers, uh, um, Jeff Tollickson, Seamus, Rhett Savage, a few other people. Uh, that was a great trip, uh, and uh, we were hiking across the canyon, and we all got delirious, and that's how we came up with our theory. <laughs> So basically, to skip ahead, the basic idea is that you have a quantum, the gray would be the superpositions, they reach this threshold by E equals H over T, uh, where E is the amount of superposition, it could also be the separation space-time geometry, then when it reaches this threshold, um, time T, there's a self-collapse, the quantum super, superposition terminates, the, the quantum computing terminates, chooses definite states, shown in number four, shown schematically here, shown in space-time separation here, the point is, this could be happening in all the neurons that, that are involved in this entanglement, and that's how you select the classical states, which can then go on to trigger the firing to make memories, to change the synapses, to do what needs to be done for cognition and consciousness. And you would need a lot more microtubules in one by E equals H over T to have, since they're inversely related, to have a short T, uh, for example, 25 milliseconds, so we can have 40 conscious moments per second. Uh, which, be much, which is much more useful than happen, having one conscious moment per hour, for example. You wouldn't get much done. And a foe or predator who had more conscious moments per time would have the advantage on you. So <clears throat> we suggested that what happens is there's entanglement from one neuron to another microtubule so that E in involves many neurons. In fact, uh, depending on, how, uh, on a various factors, like 20 to 100,000 neurons might be connected in this way, entangled, and you can have a conscious moment... Uh, 40 times a second. And Could you unpack uh, E equals H over T a little bit? Uh, yeah. Um, so um, this is actually the indeterminacy principle or a derivative of the indeterminacy principle in quantum mechanics. And uh, where E, it's also very much like the, uh, uh, if you use the speed of light uh, uh, for photons, it would be the electromagnetic uh, uh, formula for, for photons but it's Planck's constant over 2 pi, and E is a gravitational self-energy. So to have a superposition, and this is a, uh, a very tricky business, and, uh, and I'll defer to Henry on this, but how can something be in two places at the same time? It's really a fundamental question. We know that that happens in quantum mechanics, and Roger's idea was that he took general relativity and he said, well, if something over here, uh, let's say the, this particle over here is a curvature of space-time geometry in one direction, the same particle over here is a curvature in the other direction. So a particle over here would be into the screen, a particle in another place would be out of the screen, and you actually have a separation in fundamental space-time geometry. This is very much like the multiple worlds hypothesis that says every superposition branches off to form a whole new universe. But Roger's idea was, no, these, these separations are unstable, and before you get that far, before you get a whole new universe, you have a little bubble or shred in the universe, but it anneals or, or self-repairs and snaps back or pops back with a moment of consciousness to one or the other. In this case, it's choosing the one into the screen. So it's an uh, indeterminacy principle applied to consciousness, basically, um, for, a moment, for a quantum or a moment of conscious experience. Because the idea is that every time this happens, you have a, a conscious moment now uh, experience when this happens. But it also chooses classical states in the microtubules, which can you know, run the neuron. So... Uh, we connect many microtubules and many neurons through gap junctions by entanglement. And uh, I mentioned the gap junctions. And uh, 
I just want to say that uh, Gotham was telling me last night, well, I, I saw his talk at, at neuroscience about traveling waves, traveling patterns in, in hippocampus, and you can have gap junctions that, uh, let, let's say, all these striped ones are, are entangled because they're connected by open gap junctions. So as this one closes and this one opens, this whole thing can move. So you can have an envelope moving around the brain, something like this. Bing is supposed to mean consciousness happening within it. And I think that um, it's not like that activity in the brain goes to any one area to have consciousness. Consciousness, an envelope, uh, can move around the brain wherever it goes. That's where consciousness is. If it's in your sensory cortex, you're having a sensory experience. If it's in your motor or premotor, you're planning or having a motor experience. If it's wherever, that's, that's what's conscious at that moment. Everything else is on autopilot. So you're driving your car to work or your bike and you're thinking about something else. Your, con your, your, your envelope is somewhere over there, but then a horn honks or a light changes and it comes back into the cockpit and you become the pilot, a conscious pilot and take over. So consciousness, the idea, can move around the brain uh, in these envelopes determined by gap junctions, which are in turn controlled by uh, microtubules. And Gotham and other people have shown these uh, traveling patterns moving around the brain. So I'm suggesting it could be something like that and you should look at gap junctions in the type of system you're studying. And this is from a paper called The Conscious Pilot. Dendritic synchrony moves through the brain to mediate consciousness. And so according to this, E equals H over T. Uh, here's E and here's T. And this can be measured in terms of gravitational uh, self-energy, space-time separation, mass separated from itself, or the number of tubulins or the number of neurons involved. So um, as I said, you need a lot. So this would be, the top would be relatively normal 40 hertz gamma synchrony where you're having uh, 40 uh, conscious moments per second. Now in an altered state, uh, we see high gamma up to 80 meditators, uh, altered states from, from certain drugs. Uh, you have higher frequency and also higher intensity. I think E also indicates the intensity of the conscious experience. So if you're, uh, if you're just kind of dozing or, or uh, and you're having only uh, conscious, you know, four hertz uh, conscious moments, the intensity is pretty low, but then something uh, arousing happens, or, and then you go into the 40 or the 80, you're having more conscious moments per second. And we could even have nested gestalts of, uh, say, uh, delta waves enveloping a, a series of gamma waves. The point is that consciousness is a sequence of discrete moments. The moments, in, in our case, are proposed to be uh, quantum state reductions by E equals H over T. So, um, our theory, uh, again, was, was criticized, uh, uh, one objection being, well, the brain's too warm, wet, and noisy. If you try to build a quantum computer in a laboratory, you need absolute zero temperature because any slight vibration, thermal interaction, will disrupt the, uh, the delicate quantum effect. Therefore, forget about it in the brain because the brain's too warm, wet, and noisy. And we said at the time, well, you know, the brain biology's had billions of years to figure this out. Give it a break. It probably evolved a mechanism although we weren't quite sure what it was at the time. Nonetheless, it was, it was a valid objection we took seriously. Fortunately, the last six years, there have been a number of uh, findings in, in biology, quantum biology, showing uh, quantum coherence, significant functional quantum coherence. I mean, everything's quantum if you go down low enough, but we're talking about it at a functional level. Um, <clears throat> and including uh, groups here at UC Berkeley, uh, Brigitte Whaling and Graham Fleming, uh, working on photosynthesis. So it turns out in plants, Plants collect photons, you can see that at the top, into a light harvesting complex, transmit the, the energy in some way to a reaction center, which turns it into food, which we eat. Without this, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have animal. It wouldn't be animals, it wouldn't be anything. So, uh, of course, you want this energy to be transmitted at the most efficient way possible. Otherwise, you'd be losing most of the energy. So, uh, these people, uh, including those here at Berkeley, uh, showed that in this protein, there are these chromophores made of aromatic rings with a metal. I forget which metal is in them. And what they found was the electronic excitations go through these through all possible paths at the same time. That's how it's so efficient. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't get the yield we want, and our tomatoes and bananas wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be as good. So uh, this, the electronic energy is transported through all these pathways at the same time. A quantum superposition, quantum coherence, entanglement, however you want to describe it, occupying all these different pathways to get from here to here. That's the most efficient way. As little as possible is wasted. So maybe uh, you know, the, the brain figured out a similar mechanism. And that's what we think.
Now another another uh, another mech another, and I'll come back to that point. Another pr uh, problem that was pointed out to us, um, not very kindly, was uh, the fact that, but they were right in retrospect that this this idea of a protein changing shape so much, like 10% of its volume, would require a lot of energy and would generate a lot of heat. And didn't make, it didn't make much sense to have a quantum system that's, that's moving so much because it, it wouldn't be quantum. It would, be, it would interact with the environment too much. That was a valid objection. So we changed, we, we modified, we took these, this is uh, Roger and I more recently in Sweden. I was kind of being his bodyguard. He was being mobbed after a really wonderful talk he gave. And um, <clears throat> basically, we took it down to the quantum level. In our original, let me go back, in our original uh, model, uh, we have the protein shape being governed. You can't really see this, but this is supposed to be two aromatic rings, like a phenyl ring or a tryptophan ring, uh, an indole ring in aromatic amino acids. And this goes back to Froelich. This was actually Froelich's original idea in a hydrophobic pocket. And I was very familiar with hydrophobic pockets, nonpolar regions within proteins, because that's where anesthetics bind. And the idea is that these are supposed to be electrons. They flip back and forth. They, they change the, uh, the shape of the protein. So this was you know, one hydrophobic pocket with two aromatic rings, changing the shape of the protein. Well, it occurred to us that we don't really need to change the shape of the protein at all. All we need to do, all we need is a change of, of state. And so um, um, we went to the, the aromatic rings as the key, which is also the same thing in the photosynthesis protein. And if you have one, arom if you have one aromatic ring, like benzene up top, it's, it can either be oscillate between two uh, states in the uh, uh, valence theory or in molecular or at the top, molecular orbital theory, being in superposition. And one of our critics said, you can't use this as a switch because it's always going to be in that molecular orbital theory configuration of superposition. Well, we never said one. We said two. And actually, it turns out more. Now, if you, have two, if you have two rings, then they couple by what are called London forces. So if you have two nonpolar neutral electron clouds, you bring them together. The electrons in one uh, repel the electrons in the other and you form two dipoles. So you, you have induced, induced dipoles, and then they oscillate back and forth. And I knew about this because this is how anesthetics, anesthetic gases work. Anesthetic gases form their own London forces uh, in these nonpolar uh, environments inside proteins, preventing consciousness and, and uh, sparing many other things. So we developed the model to be more uh, just looking at the London force dipoles, characterizing the state of a tubulin, which would have some readout mechanism without involving the big mechanical change. So I mentioned anesthesia, and uh, the idea that, that what's the quantum stuff is happening in internal regions that are nonpolar and hydrophobic uh, goes back to my roots studying anesthesia. And um, this is from the turn of the century, uh, the last century, turn of the last century, uh, 20th century, Meyer and Overton separately, Meyer in England, Meyer in Germany and Overton in England. Uh, we're looking at a group of gases that had anesthetic potency. And they were looking for some physical parameter. They were looking at tadpoles rolling over, going belly up, mice falling over, not breathing, a bunch of different animal uh, tests for what they perceived as loss of consciousness, writing reflex, that sort of thing. And uh, so they, they knew their, their potency, which is basically called MAC, mean alveolar concentration. And the lower down, the lower the MAC, the less you need for a given effect, therefore the more potent the anesthetic. And they looked at a whole bunch of different parameters, and they found that the solubility, uh, the potency of the anesthetic correlated over many orders of magnitude with solubility in olive oil, of all things, a benzene-like medium. And uh, this, this perfectly straight line over many, many orders of magnitude was, was pretty astounding. Um, xenon, is a, uh, the inert gas, is an anesthetic. Methoxyfluorin is the most potent anesthetic at 0.25%. Now, if you think about what the, where benzene or nonpolar olive oil is in, in the body, you think of the body, this is, think of a body ground up, looked at in terms of solubility parameters, where the, as you go this way, you increase polarity, and as you go this way, you increase nonpolarity or decrease polarity. Well, it turns out this little region here of aromatic rings is where anesthetics bind, highly nonpolar. And this is, these areas are shielded from the polar environment, and I think where quantum activities occur in proteins if they are secluded in a nonpolar hydrophobic region, which is where anesthetics act. So 
Most people in the anesthetic mechanism business, okay, so when anesthetic, when, when Myron Overton found that, most people assumed that anesthetics act in lipid regions of membranes. Since most of the 20th century, they hadn't figured out the proteins were doing the dynamics of, of, of it, so it they're acting in the lipid regions. Then when it was obvious that proteins mediate, mediate excitability, ion channels, receptors, um, they tried to figure out how anesthetics act on membrane proteins, first extrinsically compressing the proteins, but eventually Franks and Lieb in the 1980s figured out that anesthetics act in hydrophobic pockets within proteins. And then the race was on to figure out which receptor uh, was, was responsible, which re to which receptor anesthetics bound to, to cause loss of consciousness. They forgot about the fact that going back uh, 150 years that Claude Bernard had shown that anesthetics act in the cytoplasm by inhibiting protoplasmic streaming. And, uh, um, which is where the microtubules are, of course. <clears throat> and uh, many, many studies over 15, 20 years of looking at anesthetic effects on membrane receptors and membrane dynamics showed no conclusive results at all. Uh, they would potentiate uh, excitatory ones and inhibit inhibitory ones. It didn't make any sense. There was no big picture, and they pretty much gave up. Uh, but we think, or I think, that anesthetics are acting in tubulin. And... The affinity of anesthetics, and this is uh, from a, this paper here in, um, in PLOS One, Travis Craddock and Jack Jasinski are two of my, my uh, main collaborators. This is showing anesthetic binding sites in tubulin. These are low affinity sites, and these are high affinity sites. Now, the high affinity sites are still a lot lower, less affinity than for GABA receptor, which is the, the favorite receptor for, even though it's an inhibitory receptor for anesthetic uh, uh, binding studies. Um, by about a thousand fold. So there's a thousand fold less affinity per tubulin compared to GABA. However, there's about a million times more um, tubulins, well, maybe not a million, there's a thousand times more tubulins per uh, uh, neuron than, than receptors, and there's at least eight high affinity sites. So at clinically relevant concentrations, there's, uh, every uh, tubulin has probably one to two anesthetic molecules bound to it, regardless of what's happening at the, at the uh, membrane. So my argument within the anesthesia mechanism uh, field is that anesthetics are, and I was kind of um, intimidated and backed off of this, but I, I've been thinking about it in recent years and more and more studies, and, and they're looking at, at membrane receptors as more and more futile. So I'm becoming more and more convinced that the primary site of anesthetic action is in tubulin to inhibit consciousness. Okay, so where in tubulin? So this is a picture of the uh, uh, aromatic rings in tubulin. Uh, let's see. So purple is phenylalanine, blue is tryptophan, green is tyrosine, and up there also I've got uh, structures of serotonin, dopamine, and, and DMT to show you that they're all very similar. A DMT and serotonin have this indole ring, the same as tryptophan, and uh, these are very similar to the ring structures that the photosynthesis people have found that uh, have the electronic... Uh, uh, quantum coherence. And here are the uh, high affinity binding sites for tubulin. And you can see they're very close. It, it's pretty much hard to miss uh, being close to these aromatic rings. So what we think is now is that um, it's, it's a topological quantum computer, which means it's not the state of each tubulin that's in superposition, but the pathway. And that within any one tubulin, you, have, you can have dipoles, going back to the London forces, pointing this way or this way, or a quantum superposition of both, a dipole qubit. Now, anesthetics come along, and by forming their own London forces, they disperse the dipole and take it away. Therefore, no superposition, no uh, collected dipole, no consciousness, no behavior. And a psychedelic... Uh, in principle, and there's actually evidence for this, promotes the quantum state by donating electron resonance energy, and you, have, you tend to have more of a quantum superposition state. You reach threshold faster and have higher intensity experiences. So that's kind of... What do you mean by more of a quantum state? Uh, if you go back to, to the slope of those, of those uh, conscious moments... Let me go back. Oops, I'm going forward. <clears throat> So, um, for example, the top would be normal consciousness. This is kind of drowsy consciousness. The so just look at the slopes. That's normal. So if you, if you have more of a quantum state, you're going to have a steeper slope. It, and you, you get to a higher E before reaching T. Uh, 
So we're assuming E is proportional to experiential intensity. So you're having more conscious moments per clock time, which would make the outside world maybe appear slower, and each one is more intense than it would under normal circumstances. So does that mean that there's more of an E? Yes. And so does that, what does that mean from a quantum physics perspective, that there's more? Uh, there's more space-time separation. There's, there's more uh, uh, separation of the... Of the, of the dipoles or the tubulins or whatever the, the material is being separated from itself. So it reaches threshold faster. It just increases the slope. And there's evidence from the 70s by Kangan Green and Snyder, Sal Snyder, the guy who invented the, or discovered the opioid receptors, where they looked at a series of phenylethylamines, which are psychoactive drugs, uh, to a receptor, and they found that the potency of the, of the phenylethylamines was directly proportional to their ability to donate electron resonance energy to the receptor. So the drugs, I think, enhance the electron resonance, enhance the tendency to go into a quantum state, enhance the transition probability between dipoles, which pushes it more to a, a quantum superposition state. So they actually showed that it actually binds to tubulin? No, this is on some other receptors. But we're trying to do that experiment. Yeah. In fact, um, DMT is endogenous. It's in all our neurons. It's all over the brain. What it's doing there, who knows? But we're, we're trying to see right now if it binds to tubulin or not. I mean, everybody assumes it's a 5-H2A receptor, binds to the membrane, but we don't know that. And uh, there's a lot of reasons to think that there's a lot more to these drugs than just binding to membrane surface receptors, as there are for anesthetics. Got it. And then the tubulin are both in the cell wall and in the cytoplasm? Only cytoplasm. Only cytoplasm. Only cytoplasm. Well, there used to be thought that they were in the membrane also, but I haven't seen that lately, so the, I'm not sure that's true. I'm pre I, I look at them as strictly in the cytoplasm. But they could be entangled or in quantum superposition with membrane proteins also. And they could be in direct contact through actin and, and uh, G-receptor, uh, G-coupled proteins, et cetera. But um, uh, I'm thinking of them in the cytoskeleton. Where you want a quantum state to be isolated from the environment. So you don't necessarily want it at the m membrane surface where it's going to be you know, bombarded with, with chaos and noise from the outside. You want to seclude. So inside the, the neuron, it's, it's secluded. And then within the tubulin, in these hydrophobic nonpolar regions, it's more secluded. Therefore, protected from decoherence. Where was I? Okay, well, this is sort of the same thing. Um, so here we have this, this band that would go, would connect to, it's curving around to the tubulin in the next, and therefore spiral up through the microtubule and, and get this. If this is a quantum channel, it would get macroscopic. It would go the length of the microtubule. So here we see just the, the, the two dipole states of superposition, and here's the anesthetized, very similar to what I just showed. All right, so quantum probability, um, a quantum uh, mathematical cognition. This is Pothos and Busmeier, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but in their target article, they have this, uh, they had this, uh, these graphs of emotional states projected as, as rays in Hilbert space. And I thought it was pretty brave of them to do that. Um, and uh, I'd never seen anything like that, and um, um, I thought it was great. Uh, but again, Hilbert space is an abstract space. So I'm not, you know, I'm a primarily a biologist, essentially, and I think in terms of biological structure. And so in my, in my response to them, I, I use their happy, sad, happy uh, whether you have a job and, and being happy or, or couple and so forth, to, and, and this is my interpretation, where these rays in Hilbert space are actually topological qubits or pathways uh, through, a, uh, through a microtubule. So this is a microtubule, and each, each of these are the uh, tubulins with the aromatic rings, and you can see you, you follow them, and that could follow and become macroscopic if it's a quantum state throughout the, the length of the microtubule. And this is another type of, this is, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get the reference from this, I got it off the internet, of, a different, uh, of another type of quantum, uh, topological quantum computer where it's the pathway that's important rather than the state of individual, uh, <coughs> individual bits. And uh, in fact, if you go back, so one of the points of this is if, if one of these tubulins gets knocked out of whack and, and gets decohered, decoherence, you don't lose the whole quantum state because it gets pulled back in by, by its neighbors. So a topological qubit is much more efficient than an ordinary qubit uh, of, a, of a particle. And in fact, a lot of people are, uh, in the, the quantum computing people are looking for topological quantum computers, Kitayev and Friedman and these guys, and they're looking for the right structure. And I think the microtubules may have evolved as topological quantum computers 
with these lattice uh, trajectories uh, being representing information. Now, if you do this, you lose information capacity because instead of each of these being a bit, the number I was bragging about before of 10 to the 16th would be a lot smaller, uh, but still way huge. So that's not a problem, I don't think. Okay, just about done. Okay, so um, uh, another way to look at this is uh, Feynman, you know, Feynman's path integral, and maybe uh, Henry can, can comment on this, that a uh, particle going from point A to point B occupies all possible paths in between, very much like in the photosynthesis where the electron goes through all those chromophores. And um, uh, if you put it in a lattice, you get what's called the Feynman quantum chessboard, or quantum walks through all possible pathways. And uh, compared to a uh, Bayesian network where you're doing random walks from here to there to here to there to here to there. In a, in a quantum a bit, you'd be taking all the pathways at the same time and then collapsing to the, to the optimal one. So that's the uh, Feynman quantum chessboard. And we can do the, the same thing in a microtubule and have different pathways and uh, getting, getting patterns. So how would that pattern scale up to uh, the whole brain? And I'll briefly go through this concept of scale invariance or, or fractal uh, one of, our F, one of our F fractal like brain processing structures, uh, Marcus Rakeley, uh, 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 Dante Chialvo, uh, Bullmore, Vandeville, all these, uh, a number of people have been talking about this the last four or five years uh, in electrophysiological terms. If you measure uh, different scales, different uh, time scales and spatial scales, and go down, you get the same pattern re repeating. It's, it's like a fractal in some way. Self-similar electrophysiology, uh, holographic maps in hippocampus, fractal eye movements, distributed memory going back many years, small world networks, uh, grid cell hexagons, dendritic arbors, microtubule networks. So what does this mean? So um, we have, I think, what's a basically a, a geometric, perhaps hexagonal uh, lattice. And if we get to grid cells in the entorhinal cortex, we have this, this same uh, hexagonal lattice that, that really is hard to explain, where the animals seem to know where they are in the spatial domain uh, in a grid. And if you look at different layers, you get the same uh, hexagonal pattern at different scales, kind of like a, a Google map zooming in and out, suggesting some kind of fractal uh, holographic type arrangement of spatial uh, identity, which reminded me of the Library of Babel, which I read, I think, when I was in college, of a vast library of hexagonal rooms, uh, which seemingly meaningless, but every possible ordering. And there's the, uh, the Library of Babel. Uh, which I, I think there may be some kind of hexagonal uh, uh, fractal process or geometry going on in the brain. So, to conclude, first, uh, I think uh, we need to consider a deeper scale, uh, finer scale, deeper order of information processing in interneuronal microtubules to explain cognition and consciousness. Mental activities uh, match quantum mathematics more closely than classical Bayesian mathematics. And uh, you could take the argument, well, the brain's classical, but it simulates quantum, but that doesn't really make sense. Uh, as I was saying earlier, if, if the brain walks, swims, and quacks like a quantum duck, it's probably a quantum duck. Uh, topological quantum computation in dendritic somatic microtubules of integrating fire brain neurons can regulate firings and control behavior. So I think uh, conscious, the essential features of consciousness may well be in dendrites and, and, and cell bodies, controlling firings. Um, and... Consciousness and cognition are likely to involve scale invariant fractal like representations from microtubules on up. The, fractal, the people who are studying this electrophysiologically stop at the neuron, but I think they have to go uh, further down. And finally, neurological and psychiatric therapy should target microtubules. So, uh, for example, post operative cogn cognitive dysfunction, we have this problem in anesthesia. Occasionally, elderly people who may have Alzheimer's or uh, even if they don't, uh, aren't quite the same after anesthesia for a while. And there's many reasons, the surgery, the stress, and so forth, but there seems to be an effective anesthetic. And if they're binding, if they're disassembling microtubules, that can contribute. Alzheimer's would be the same thing. Concussions, uh, which are epidemic in sports right now, there's a recent finding that the microtubules are, are shattered in, in neurons in concussion. Uh, of course, if you have a brain injury, you want to promote microtubule activity for synaptic plasticity, for regeneration of neurons or regeneration of synaptic connections, upkeep and, and maintenance of existing ones and making new ones. And uh, uh, as far as psychiatric therapies, who knows, M maybe depression. So one therapy I just want to mention that, that we're looking at is transcranial ultrasound. Ultrasound is used for imaging uh, virtually any part of the body, you know, babies in the, in the uterus. Uh, we use it in anesthesia to look, look for blood vessels that we want to uh, stick. and and nerves that we want to block and so forth. 
But um, a guy named Jamie Tyler a number of years ago, uh, you know, there's transcranial electrical, transcranial magnetic stimulation, not to mention all the invasive stimulation techniques. He started doing transcranial ultrasound and found behavioral and, and, um, and electrophysiological effects in animals. And, uh, you know, as Andy tried it, and it got a very interesting ef effect, actually. When you do it, you don't feel anything for about a minute, and then you kind of get a buzz, to be honest with you. And it was kind of interesting. And so we did a study that's coming out in brain stimulation, I think in the next month, of uh, a transcranial ultrasound effects on mental states, a pilot study. We did a very simple study. We're doing a second study, again, with this machine that we wheel around and we s image. You can see the brain, so we know it's getting through the skull and back. And there's a company that we're working with that's making a, a headset that's going to, you'll be able to walk around with it. That we'll be, we're going to hope to try on people with, with uh, brain injury, uh, depression, a number of things, Alzheimer's, concussion, so forth. So uh, the bottom line is uh, take care of your tubules and everything else will be okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sean. Hi, sir. I'm love to talk. Um, just one or, one or two minor points before I go into the major argument. Duisburg is indeed here, uh, despite repeated attempts to get rid of him. But he has moved on from oncogenes to uh, a more um, dogmatic emphasis on aneuploidy, and it looks like he's correct. Yeah, I thought he was always an aneuploidy, but he got in trouble for something else. He, the, he H for, for HIV. Yeah. You'll be right about that as well. But, but um, the, the, the second one um, is with respect to the Hodgkin-Huxley model, um, this does not actually commit you to spiking. And in fact, um, the Hodgkin-Huxley model can support um, subtrusial oscillations, which means that you can get very, very complex wave superpositions, which indeed people like Patrick Soupies are looking at as, as ways of how um, the vastly complicated... What do you mean by super... You don't mean quantum superpositions. Not, not at the moment, classical, but let's, let's, move, let's move on to, to, the, to the really critical thing I, I, I have to say here. I did some... Uh, I published some stuff with Walter Freeman on on um, really this issue of the um, synchronized ga gamma and uh, the effects it has particularly on the background white noise of, of the brain. And the conclusion we came to is, is actually that um, if we look at how synchronized gamma super, superposes over the background white noise, um, we come to a conclusion that conscious moments are about 10 per second maximum. This actually fits with the psychological um, data. And, and I would also su suggest, suggest, with respect to what you're doing, that the high gamma, there are people like Brad Wojtek here and Ryan uh, Canolti who have some very good ECOG data. And high, high gamma is not actually just specific to meditators or anything like that. It looks like we all get a lot of high gamma, not just at 80 hertz as you have there, but in uh, the region of hundreds of hertz. Now, this, this actually brings us to uh, really the question I want to ask. Um, I believe that the uh, Freeman findings are pretty robust, and I, he has the notion that what really happens in consciousness is... Now, which findings? There's 10 conscious moments per second? or the that, that actually, what really, um, what really is going on is that... Um, in the case of synchronized gamma, that it super, super imposes. We've got a, a, a classic, um, we can do this with, um, look at it as a signal processing problem. And actually we find that, you mentioned Marcus Reichley, okay? Um, Marcus Reichley's work on dark energy of the brain, okay? Um, Default mode. It, it obtains here, we have about 20% of the total uh, metabolic demand of the organism is actually consumed by the brain from moment to moment. When um, this um, superimposition happens, um, the um, metabolic demand goes down by four orders of magnitude. This is all solid. We, we, actually have, we have actually published this. And I'm just wondering if you're open to really a, a kind of um, um, different kind of model, instead of focusing on stuff like tubulin, um, basically an argument that says, right, we do know now from photosynthesis that actually at physiological temperatures we can get quantum coherence, which they told you 20 years ago was nonsense, and it turns out you were correct about that. I wonder if you're open to, to really a, a model in which we argue that consciousness is something which is, if you like, um, ubiquitous, and that um, what actually happens in particular coherent states of the brain um, 
it can actually um, become salient. That there are these 10 times a second or so when um, a conscious moment can actually exist, but it may be a slightly different mechanism to what you're talking about. Well, first of all, 10, 10 per second as opposed to 40 per second is no problem. By e equals h over t, t is then equal to 100 milliseconds as opposed to 25. That's number one. Number two, I showed that envelope for the, I think it was delta, but the, where you have a, a, a number of a smaller ones. For example, in visual perception, you might see shape, color, motion, meaning, gestalt, collapse. So all of the, 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 the briefer ones build up to this envelope where you have a gestalt moment. And we, uh, Nancy Wolf and I published that in 2001. So I don't, have a, I don't have a problem with that. Now, if you're talking about consciousness in the universe and getting into a more of a philosophical, even Buddhist type of approach, I don't have a problem with that either. In fact, um, Roger, you know, uh, Ro I started to tell Henry this before, but, um, you know, it used to be uh, Roger and I talked in terms of avoiding decoherence until you could reach an OR threshold by e equals H over T. And he realized, and in our last paper, and in the paper we're writing now, he says that, that really what we see as decoherence is really E equals H over T. So if there's a superposition in the environment somewhere, anywhere, out in the air, wherever, it's going to quickly interact with the environment around it, which is random, and, and it will reach threshold very quickly, but it'll be random and won't have any cognition, it won't have any inf information. And so that is what builds the world around us, and that the, these OR moments everywhere. But we distinguish now orc or from or from or orc meaning that there's some cognition or 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 information that's that's associated with it so that it's a it's an orchestrated moment it has information embedded in it as opposed to a sort of random non-informative moment of consciousness that's happening all around us so it's kind of a buddhist thing yeah um, so uh, thank you for speaking i really appreciate laying all this out in a pretty coherent argument thank you too much of the mechanistic detail. I think really what you provided is more of sort of the approach to understanding perhaps the mechanism of consciousness, uh, maybe taking this to a different level. Now, in biology, we have the notion of emergent property, uh, and so perhaps consciousness is that. And the other thing that comes to mind is getting back to qualia, which is, could this explain qualia, or is it sort of, in a sense, like what we're doing with neuroimaging, where we're sort of mapping out corollaries of consciousness right. experience? So right. Uh, right. Well, your first. Okay. Let me. The quality first. Oh, emergence. Yeah. I. I in a sense, e equals h over t is an emergence. You know, it defines an emergence. The problem I have with with people who talk about, and I don't. You know, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, but people have been talking about emergence for for decades. That you get complex enough, and something happens, and you have a novel property. Like wetness from water is an emergent property, and there's a million other examples. And so you get an, enough complicated processing, and consciousness happens. Maybe, but I've yet to see a threshold. I've yet to see a, a testable prediction. It's just, as far as I can tell, a hand-waving argument. You get complicated enough, and something happens. Maybe that's true, but it'd be nice to have an equation, nice to have a, a prediction. We at least have a prediction. If E equals H over T happens, whether it's in an electron or a, or a buckyball or a tubulin, you're going to have a moment of conscious experience. An electron might have a conscious moment, but it would take 10 million years because E is so small and be very, very feeble, not worth waiting for. But we have all this tubulin so that E is, gets big and, and T is small. Now, as far as qualia, um, we, uh, we wrote a paper in 1996 on the hard problem, which addresses qualia, qualia being the the phenomenal experience, qualitative aspects of any, of any conscious experience. And what we said was that uh, since Roger had put platonic values embedded in the fine scale structure of the universe, we, we said, well, it's logical to think that qualia are the, or at least the precursors of qualia, you know, redness, maybe joy, grief, or whatever, are particular configurations in underlying space time geometry. And um, if, if there's a red rose over there, the space time geometry in it has a particular configuration, and I perceive it, and the space-time geometry in my brain adapts, adopts that same configuration. So I'm essentially, you could say I'm entangled with it, or maybe it's just reproducing the same configuration, so the qualia occurs in my brain. So we put qualia at the most fundamental level of the universe, the same place where spin, mass, charge, everything comes from. It's, you know, what, what it is down there, you know, who knows, strings, quantum geometry, spin networks, twisters, I don't know. And, um, you know, Roger has some idea about that. Maybe Henry has some ideas. But the point is that we're ascribing uh, qualia to uh, 
or at least protoqualia, depending on how you define it, to the most basic level of the universe, irreducible, fundamental, giving rise to these properties, just like the same level gives rise to mass spin and charge. Yeah. So it seems, I'm new to this, so this is going to be a very naive question. Um, it seems like you ascribe quite a lot of computational power to even a single neuron. Yes. And there must be an observable as a result of the computation, otherwise you wouldn't have an effect. So what's the experiment that allows you to disambiguate your model from anything classical okay, at the level of a single neuron to a neuron? Well, I don't, uh, you know, I, I would refer you to a, a single, a, a different type of cell, like a, a paramecium. A paramecium, if you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes. If you do it again, it escapes faster and faster. It learns. It can find food, mates, have sex, if that's a sign of intelligence. Uh, it can do all kinds of things. Slime mold, an amoeba, one cell, sends out these tendrils, much like axons and dendrites. There have been a number of papers in the last couple of years about slime mold, solving equations, escaping mazes, doing all kinds of things. So... How to do it for a neuron, I don't know. You, I, I'm not, I, that's a good question. I have to think about it. Maybe somebody else can think of it. But a single cell, I mean, the point is that a neuron in a, is considered a, a, a one or a zero in a network, fire or not fire, and I think that's an insult to neurons. Well, but, but your argument with the other cells, the, the obstacle there, and I'm not, you know, again, the argument there is that those computations are likely doable with protein networks and kinase and phosphorylation and then, you know, the central model, all that stuff, because they're simple enough that you can... So, so in other words, that you, you don't necessarily need your model to have a paramecium turn left or right or have chemotaxis. Or you don't need quantum, but you need information processing and microtubules. I'm distinguishing between classical information processing... I'm not saying a paramecium is conscious. I'm saying that it's using its microtubules to, to process information for cognition. You know, it's probably not, it would have to be still, you know, equals H over T. It would have to be, T would have to be fairly long. So it's kind of interesting that the only time they're absolutely still is when they're having sex. So maybe that was the first conscious experience. And that, it would certainly promote, uh, promote you know, uh, promulgation of the species. The more interesting part of your model is that quantum computing and, and this collapse of, you know, into a certain state is responsible for some amount of cognition or, or neural processing. That's consciousness. But you can have cognition without consciousness. Right, but my point is, Okay, so you're giving me the fact that microtubules process information are responsible for okay, non-conscious... Yeah, let's, let's say that. We, Thank that, you. I think that's, you know. I'll quit and go home right now. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, it's a good question. Actually, uh, here's, here's the experiment uh, I would like to... There's this guy in Japan who's done these amazing experiments, but he hasn't published them yet for various reasons. But he takes a single microtubule, puts four electrodes on them, uses two to stimulate and two to record. And... Normally, they're good insulators. They don't conduct. However, at certain resonant frequencies, they become conductive. In fact, almost arguably quantum coherent between here and here at certain resonant frequencies. The megahertz, for example, the same resonant frequencies we're using uh, or trying to use ultrasound to stimulate microtubules. So the experiment would be you, get, you stimulate this single microtubule at a certain resonant frequency and get this quantum conductance, superconductive-like effect. You then... Add anesthesia, you anesthetize the system, and it goes away. You then use a different anesthetic that's twice as potent, and you need half as much to get the same effect. These are called max studies in anesthesia. So if you did that for a series of anesthetics and showed a perfect, like the Meyer-Overton correlation with solubility in, in olive oil, showed that for inhibition and prevention of quantum coherence in microtubules, that would be a testable, that's a testable prediction and an experiment that I think can be done and, and will be done. So it uh, seems that like gap junctions play a pretty essential part in a lot of this processing and model between neurons. Uh, but it's my understanding that gap junctions are sort of the exception to the rule as far as synapses go in the brain, if we want to say they're synapses so much, um, that they're like rather rare as opposed to chemical synapses. Probably about 10% of the number of chemical synapses, but that's still a huge number. Okay, um, but it's my understanding further that they're like limited to more like certain nuclei. When I, when I think of gap junctions, I think of like... Um, VMEs, the mesencephalic nucleus of the germinal. They're all over cortex. A, guy, a Fukuda in Japan has mapped them out in cortex. And they're all over the place. And inner neurons are very rich in gap junctions, and they, have, they make dual synapses. So the, a, a, an inner neuron will have a, a gap junction connection and, a, and, a GABA, and an inhibitory GABA connection with the same neuron. So even if they're 10%, even if they're 1%, how many synapses are in their brain? I mean, you've got, you got plenty of gap junctions. And... Uh, the interesting thing is that they seem to be neuron to neuron, uh, not neuron to glia, which we first thought, 
at least that's the latest. But interneurons have them, and interneurons connect everything. And wherever you look for them, they seem to be there. They're in thalamus. They're, they're all over the place. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This is exciting because it's, in some sense it's very close to a project I worked on a couple decades ago. Um, certainly in terms of taking on the, the usual um, way that people look at things. So I want to see if there's a way to connect what you're doing to what that was. And what that was was basically saying neurons aren't simple. They're really complex. They're tiny, incredibly fast computations happening, nonlinear ones inside dendritic trees. Um, it's a sharpening, not an integrating. Um, so in some sense, that's the direction you're going, but you've gone like a thousandfold farther by saying it's at the megahertz level rather than the sub-millisecond level, and it's at the atomic level and the quantum level rather than sort of the spine or uh, small Well, it's difference. more at the level of the aromatic rings as, as qubits, but getting so, there. So the one thing is that project was plain old membrane. It was membranes and Hodgkin Huxley and all the rest, and capacitance and, and all the boring thermal stuff. Um, and I can imagine a connection between the microtubules and, say, microdendrite computations if I knew how it is that the state of one of these things, whether it's clockwise twisting or counterclockwise or up or down, whatever you call it, how that quantum mechanical state affects membrane voltage. Because it's clear that membrane voltage really matters a whole bunch and somehow turns into action potentials. So what's the crossover? How do the microtubules talk to the membrane voltage so that the things that we know about and believe in actually happen? Well, first of all, as I showed in that uh, paper by Nondorf et al., there's some factor other than membrane potential that influences firing. And uh, only in awake animals as opposed to in vitro or simulation. They showed this variability. It's one of the earlier slides I showed. I did variability, so I know there's tons of sources of it. So the fact well, this, is, this would be the major source then. What I would argue is that the major source of this variability in terms of triggering spikes is computation going on in the microtubules inside the dendrite. That dendrite, that soma, but also connected to others by gap junction, so you have this collective integration. If you have a whole layer of dendrites uh, uh, that are connected sideways, so you have, you have a sort of network going that way, and then sideways you have these connections, there's this collective integration in the microtubules which influence the firing. So the Nondorf paper shows How, that there... Uh, that was the part. How do they influence it? Okay, so you're asking uh, w without affecting the membrane or with affecting oh, the membrane? I'm, well, they, the, the is a membrane voltage shape. So on the axon connected. side, I'm talking about the dendrite side. So I'm talking on this side of the axon hillock or the axon initiation segment, there's computations going around. So a particular, uh, a particular output uh, state of a microtubule might... Uh, the C-termini tails, for example, stick up and uh, they're charged and they can, they can uh, draw ions or repel, uh, attract or repel ions to influence uh, ionic effects at the membrane. It could be something uh, with, uh, with, with some other mechanism, uh, kind of like the inverse of a G-coupled protein or something like that. Or it could be that it doesn't go through the membrane, it goes right through the cytoplasm to the axon hillock. I mean, uh, the other thing about the, the Nondorf study that was interesting was uh, not only is there this variability, but, the, but if you look on the axonal side, the 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 uh, the spikes are are very vertical as opposed to if there were sequential uh, ion channels opening this ion channel this ion this ion so forth you would get a a, a slanted uh, slope but they're very they're almost vertical which means that these ion channels are opening simultaneously suggesting that there's some kind of and some people there's quantum coherence among ion channels so that they're all entangled and opening at the same time so but I, going back to your question I think that there could be you know, there's stuff going on. I mean, the microtubules and the dendrites are not disrupted or interrupted from the micro... Uh, well, we don't really know how they interact with the, the microtubules on the exon initiation segment. Normally, I wouldn't want to interrupt, but I've heard... I want to just say back what you said, or the part I liked about it, which is that normally you have a certain number of ion channels opening from whatever synaptic events there were. That's sort of the standard model, and that's done thermally. Each one of those ion channels opens at its same time, sort of as if synaptic events were completely... Unaffected. At the same time? Just a sec. In a standard model, they open inside an envelope, but the actual opening of individual channels is presumably uncoordinated, like simple models say the actual synaptic events are uncoordinated, so they tend to blur off and be kind of smooth. If you can get those, the same number, so the same net current, if you can get that lined up to cross a threshold because of the computation the final regular old computation is nonlinear, that threshold crossing, the mere coordination of the same ion channels, if there's some quantum mechanical effect, 
would in fact produce that kind of effect? Well, what, what I was saying about the, the ion channel would be on the axonal side, that they all open at the same time. So that's why the spike is vertical as, as opposed to that. Uh, what's happening on the, on the pre, you know, on the other side, I would say there has to be something intrinsically in the cytoskeleton to account for the non-door findings where you alter the, the uh, variability or you alter the spiking threshold on a spike-to-spike basis without affecting membrane potential. So the, I think there's some other factor, some X factor inside the neuron, something to do with the microtubules. Henry. Um, my question's about um, causation and consciousness. You talk about consciousness. Uh, part of the time that you're talking, it sounds like the mechanism, the tubular mechanism, is <coughs> kind of a mechanist, mechanistic thing controlled by quantum mechanics, and it uh, will somehow uh, lead to the separation, and then an event will occur, and it will uh, be a conscious event. So, insofar as that choice is random, uh, your conscious would just be an output. Well, who said it's random? I'm saying, yes, so far as it was random, it would just be an output of the mechanical uh, processes that you're talking about. So, are you saying that, no, that once the separation, for example, you had the spiral, the happy spiral, and you yeah. had the unhappy spiral? So, let's say they were both in superposition, they collapsed to one or the other. Right, exactly. Are you saying that there's some reason that it was going to collapse to the happy spiral rather than the unhappy spiral, for example? Uh, well, all the, all the, imp I the normal influences go into it. For example, in that, in that uh, paper, they, he talked about having a job or not having a job. If you have a job, generally you, you tend to be happy. If you don't have a job, you tend to be not happy. On the other hand, you might hate your job and it might work the other way. Well, there'd be a correlation, okay. An influence, right. But still, at the moment of collapse, there's some other influence that kicks in. In Penrose's view, it's not random, but it's platonic from the universe somehow which, let's say, it would be optimistic, it tends to push into happy rather than unhappy. So that's what you're saying, that the choice that's made here is going to tend to favor your happy spirals. And it's going to favor what the values in the, embedded in the universe that are determining... I'm happy, I'm just okay. letting yeah. the value that right. the universe yeah. prefers. Yeah, it's a process in that medium, and, the, and it's the medium, in this case space-time geometry, where the qualia are, where the platonic values are, way down at the Planck scale, are, in, are influencing one choice or the other. Because these two structures, the unhappy structure and the happy structure, physically look probably equally uh, complicated. And, uh, well, they have different so angles. I'm saying that there's, the universe knows that this one corresponds to something it values, and this other structure corresponds to something that it doesn't value and abhors or doesn't. You're getting pretty philosophical, and I should say, I don't know if you guys know Henry Stapp, he's like, uh, belongs in the uh, Mount Olympus of quantum physics, uh, physicists in this area, and your, your view is more that consciousness uh, causes collapse. I'm asking your view. Okay. My view is that consciousness is collapse, that consciousness is self-organizing, uh, self-reduction by E equals H over T that occurs whenever E equals H over T, and the collapse, when the collapse occurs, there's some kick, some influence, kind of like a uh, bias in a slot machine or a roulette wheel that's going to push it one way or the other, that's due to fine structure of the universe, which is where the separation is happening. And you're saying that that bias, the universe favors some things over other things, namely the happy job, have a job. Yeah, now you could say, well, why, are the, you know, why did Hitler happen? You know, why, well, you know maybe people are, are wired backwards. You are saying that the universe has a preference. Yes. For, well, has has values. Has values yeah. Makes the choice, not random, but favors. Yeah, Roger says that, and I agree with him. Okay. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have many possibilities to collapse in the next few days. <laughs> so feel free to ask and uh, meet with Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here.